Hello, and welcome to God Pods, where we host faith conversations, brought to you by Boston College's Church in the 21st Century Center. Hello, everyone. I'm Lynn Baradelli, Associate Director for the Church in the 21st Century Center at Boston College. Thanks for joining our Faith Feeds Book Club conversation on the Miracle Collectors. With us today are the authors of the book, Joan Louise Hill and Katie Mann. Joan and Katie, we are so grateful to have you with us today, so thank you. Published in 2021, The Miracle Collectors is the second book for Katie and Joan. Their first, The Miracle Chasers, published in 2010, contained their own remarkable miracles, and then it sparked an outpouring of many, many more stories, which resulted in The Miracle Collectors. Having spent 20 years becoming miracle experts, Katie and Joan have created something truly inspirational together. And if you don't mind, Katie and Joan, I wanted to mention to our listeners that this book and its three sections help us first in becoming aware of miracles in our lives, second in deepening connection with others through miracles, and third in finding meaning through miracles and faith. So let's get started with some questions that we have for Joan and Katie, and then we'll open up to a few questions from our Faith Feeds friends. Joan, um, the two of you have been researching miracles for over 20 years. Um, And from what I've read and discussed with you, this book, this particular book, this is your second book on miracles, this particular book was not planned. What happened between the first book and the second book? What inspired you to write The Miracle Collectors? Um, Well, thank you so much, Lynn. And I really want to say on behalf of Katie and I, thank you so much for having us because this is such a pleasure. You know, um, I should say that, you know, Katie and I and the list of things when we were little girls thinking about what we would be when we grew up, uh, being a miracle collector or a miracle chaser were not was not in the list of possibilities. So uh, we came to this sort of later in, later in life. And so, you know, we had these events that happened to us that we describe at great length in, in each of the books. Um, and as Catholics, we know we grew up with this understanding of obligation. You know, we have whole days of, of, of obligation, if you will. So it's not a big surprise that we actually became obligated, felt obligated to tell these stories of how the divine had touched our lives. So our goal with the first book was, um, which was published in 2010, was to tell our stories within this context of this exploration of miracles through the centuries. Because philosophers, theologians, scientists, men of letters had all taken on the subject of miracles. And so we set out in this sort of very, you know, as Jesuit educated women, we thought we'll just get to the bottom of this and try to provide a new perspective perhaps. So um, what happened was once we told our stories, we were shocked at the numbers of people who shared their own stories in return. In fact, people couldn't wait to tell their stories. You know, we don't know if it was because we shared our own vulnerability in telling a story. Um, Perhaps it was, you know, that we provided this safe environment that was sort of free from judgment. Uh, Or maybe we gave people permission or a vocabulary to tell their stories. Regardless, these stories for us were this unexpected gift. Um, You know, we, we all have stories and we knew everyone else had a story, but how they told these stories, you know, they were... Um, stories, some of them they had never told before. They hadn't wanted to look foolish. They didn't know what to do with this miracle experience. It's not like we have a place in our brain where, you know, miracles are stored, if you will. They had no idea if other people would believe them. And somehow we became the story keepers. Um, To be honest, it was a little bit intimidating, but people, because people had entrusted us with these amazing stories, um, these defining moments of their lives. And it was a responsibility we really took seriously and with reverence, to be honest. So there's lots of books out there, beautiful stories, you know, think chicken soup for the soul. And, you know, who doesn't love a good story? Certainly I do. Um, But we wanted to do something a little bit different. We wanted to give legs to these stories. We wanted to give them context and meaning. And at the end of the day, we really wanted to let everyone know that they too could experience the miraculous. We weren't special in any way, any more so than anyone else. So in writing, there's a thing that you, you know, you're supposed to write only something that you can do that's personal to you. And so that's what we did. And that's really how the Miracle Collective. 
Awesome, thank you. Katie, Katie, I wanted to ask you about the collection process for these. How, how, did, how did the stories come to you? How, how did that evolve? How did people approach you? How were you able to collect? What was that collection process like? Well, um, as Joan might have alluded to, you know, what was unexpected between the first book and the second book, or after we wrote the first book, we traveled all over the country and we started these uh, talks, whether they were in libraries or bookstores or whatever it was, by sharing our own miracle stories. And what we didn't expect is that that would give permission to other people to share theirs. We just, they came out of the woodwork. You know, we would share these, you know, stories of ourselves and um, it just prompted other people to share theirs. So, so the most obvious place that we got these miracle stories is uh, when we gave these talks. You know, there was the, um, the student, another Jesuit school, Georgetown, we had given a talk um, to uh, a large alumni group in San Francisco for Georgetown. And one of the students came up afterwards and said, can dreams be miracles? And, you know, can I share this story with you? <laughs> you know, Joan and I were like, um, yes, you may. <laughs> uh, so, you know, and, and um, there was another example in a bookstore where someone was there with her daughter and her best friend, neither of whom had ever heard a story that she then shared with us at the end when we asked the question. Then there were some not so obvious places where we got miracle stories. I was on an airplane one time and my seatmate just leaned over and said, gee, is that book you're reading about a dog or is there a dog in that book? And um, she of course had no idea what I did or that I had written a book about miracles. And uh, she, I think I have a miracle magnet face. That's what I've decided <laughs> because she proceeded to tell me this miracle story um, about, uh, about her dog Daisy and how she came to be in her life. And then there were, you know, miracle stories that we found in the news. There were friends of friends who heard that we were doing this and were so interested in sharing their stories with us. I think one of the most interesting things that happened once we started collecting stories is that every single story that you read about in the book um, that was told to us, for example, that wasn't in the news, we went back to each of these individuals and um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, to clarify their story, to make sure that A, we had their permission to put it in the book, B, that we had their story more or less that we had you know, related in the correct way. But the, another unexpected thing that happened is we sort of talked to them about what did it mean to you? What happened in the aftermath? Is there anything that you'd like to add? That was a really interesting uh, journey with some of the people that, that shared their stories with us. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, Joan, I, one of the things I wanted to mention to you was that I found the topics that, that you discuss in the book incredibly uplifting and hopeful. And given the, what we've been through the past couple of years in our world, um, I wanted you to see if you could speak a little bit more about how the message of the book is relevant today uh, and the reaction that you've gotten from people uh, since its launch. Oh, easily. So one of the things that, that happens in the publishing process is it takes a really long time for the time the book is written to the time it gets out into the public. So we submitted this original manuscript um, in January of 2020. COVID was just a little blip that had maybe just appeared, first case actually in Santa Clara, California. Um, and so we had no idea what was really ahead of us. So, you know, we believe that like Miracle Collectors is this book of possibilities. So it really takes, the book takes the, the reader on a journey with us to explore these extraordinary stories, you know, from ordinary people. Um, and, you know, the hope is that we'll all gain this new perspective. So it's a book about hope and inspiration at a time when, oh my gosh, we're all suffering from, you know, overload, the consequences of a pandemic, now a war in Ukraine, you know, globalist insecurity that's in the world you know, financial uncertainty, this political polarization that's, you know, uh, throughout our country. Um, you know, sometimes we can feel helpless. We can feel hopeless, you know, not to mention that we have all this dysfunction of, of just being connected from the multiple devices that are at our, at our fingertips. So the Miracle Collectors to me really reminds us to be aware of the beauty that surround us, you know, that of the kindness of our own light, of the importance of gratitude, of love, um, of faith and of forgiveness, uh, and actually of a loving God, right? 
these things don't cost anything. They're available to all of us. You know, and in this time of isolation that we've been through, it's been so important to realize we're not alone. You know, we have faced this calamity, but we've also had these moments of joy, maybe unexpected joy in, you know, some of the YouTube videos we might have watched where families put together things in the banging of the pots and pans or, or other kind of messages of gratitude that people did for the healthcare workers. You know, um, we perhaps even more appreciated the good even more than we might have because we've realized you know how how horrific this covid pandemic has really been in so many places you know our human nature i think wants to find this good um and so that's kind of where we um really felt that the book is you know perfectly timed the other reaction we got from people was that while some people told their stories other people wanted to find out how to take a spiritual journey and you know how do you do this and it's one of those things that sounds easier than maybe it is so that's where you know Katie and I really came up with the idea of we wanted to give people a, a personal and a practical approach to sort of begin embark on this per, uh, this uh, spiritual journey and so at the end of each chapter there's a take a miracle moment challenge that people can complete kind of in a way to help us get back to that spiritual core because when we don't pay any attention to that we're like an incomplete puzzle with that you know missing missing important piece um, and it's a way to reconnect with our spiritual side so that's kind of, um, I think, where the book has this particular appeal, even now, especially now. Especially now. I, I completely agree. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Katie, one of the things that struck me the most was the availability or accessibility of miracles to everyone. So I wanted to see if you could define miracles for us, how you define miracles, and then also talk about the continuum of miracles that you mentioned in the book. Sure. I mean, the million dollar question is, what is a miracle? And, you know, 20 years ago, when Joan and a third friend of ours who, who uh, helped write book number one, it's the first question we asked. Um, it turned out to be the hardest question to answer. And it took years of research and I think soul searching for us to get our own answer to that question, question um, what is a miracle, which I'll share in, in a minute, but before I do, you know, we sort of started with an idea about miracles that was very much related to our Catholic upbringing. I mean, we thought about miracles in a big, bold, um, miracles in the Bible, like, you know, uh, walking on water, uh, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Of course, you know, the biggest miracle of all the resurrection, these thunderbolts. Uh, these thunderbolt miracles. And what we came to recognize is that miracles are actually in every, you know, wisdom and faith tradition around the globe, from Native American culture to the three monotheistic uh, religions and um, everything in between. But I'd say with this book, what we really put into practice was this idea that you mentioned about miracles on a continuum, that in fact, those thunderbolt miracles that we'd always, you know, sort of thought about, they're on one side of the continuum, but at the other side of the continuum is this idea of the everyday miracle that is available to every one of us. Um, and we all have, you know, we all have access to them. So if you think about you know, um, a coincidence that maybe saves the day, or a sign that you know was meant especially for you to let you know that you're on the right path. Or maybe it's a stranger that has a message for you that says something at exactly the right time. You know, this idea that we wrote a whole chapter about that you can be the miracle for someone else. You know, we think about miracles as uh, us asking God to say yes to us, right? you know, heal my friend, can we please have peace on earth, you know, whatever. But this idea of be the miracle is really about us saying yes to God, us being the conduit for God um, in, you know, figuring out maybe what our job is to help somebody else. And finally, on that continuum, and, and something that I think is especially accessible to all of us, is this notion of wonder and awe that we can find in, in the beauty 
of um, the natural world. So m the word miracle actually comes from the Latin mirari, which means to wonder. So um, obviously we think that that makes sense as well. So the definition that we came up with after the, you know, towards the end of the first book really applies to this whole continuum. And the definition is that a miracle is a sign of divine intervention in the world that creates a beneficial and unfolding connection with, uh, between God and humankind. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I wanted to ask you, um, Joan, uh, why do you think it's so hard for us all to real realize miracles in our own lives? Well, I think that there are several reasons. You know, I alluded to a couple of them. One is sometimes, you know, if we think something might have happened or might have, you know, we don't want to look foolish sometimes. But I think um, the biggest reason is perhaps that we're actually too busy to stop and pay attention. You know, our first kind of big insight theme in our book is really becoming aware. You know, we have to be, learn to pay more attention to what is around us. You know, we live in this, you know, gadget loving, multitasking, sleep deprived, you know, over sensory overloaded world, world. And it's really hard to stop and pay attention. It's hard to be aware. You know, um, Katie likes to say we, we're, we all like to think we're aware, but frankly, we kind of go through you know, we go through our lives at, you know, um, a fast pace and we don't take the time to just take a deep breath. Um, it takes intention, it takes practice. And so I think sometimes we just miss them. Um, the other thing I think that really happens is we have a hard time realizing that we might be worthy of a miracle. You know, we're not that holy um, Mother Teresa person, like she should have a miracle. There's no doubt about that in any of our minds, but me? You know, maybe not so much. Um, and so it's hard for us to maybe realize that we are worthy of, you know, th this intersection between the divine and ourselves. That's really, I mean, that was a huge stumbling block for me personally. Like, why would he worry? Why would God worry, take time out of their busy day to pay attention to me? Um, but, you know, the, it, it is important. We're all worthy. We're all, you know, God's children. Um, I think the other thing is we spend so much time with our heads, you know, down, mired in our everyday minutia, that it's hard to lift our heads up and sort of see what's around us, you know, much less look for this wonder. And as Katie said, you know, miracles at their foundation are wonder. And um, I had a funny experience last month when I was uh, skiing in, in Aspen in Colorado, where my husband's from. I, uh, you know, eagles are important to all of us BC people, right? And so I've cross country for 40 years in the same place and I have never seen an eagle at the same time every day. So I'm cross country and I look up and there's this magnificent eagle, you know, over my head and just, you know, they don't flap their wings. They just sort of glide and they're huge. And I'm just going, oh my gosh, you know, I got to get out my cell phone and I've got to take, pic take a picture and share this. And then another eagle sort of dropped down from the clouds and I'm like, whoa, this is like so great again, taking, taking photos, and then they went off as they do. Um, and I looked at my cell phone and I had nothing. I had a black screen and I said, ah, somebody's trying to tell me something. Joan, maybe awareness and awe don't require a cell phone. Maybe they just, we have to remember, you know, in, in engage our brains and our heads and our memories and have these visions of wonder stay with us. Um, so it, for me, it was a reminder that, you know, wonder like miracles exist and they may be in very unexpected places. Mm. So that awareness is really important. So important, so important. And as, as you said, not always easy to remember. So um, I'm gonna ask one more question and then I'm gonna open, I'm gonna open it up to the floor, but, um, Katie, I wanted to ask you, so what happens though when people, what impact have you seen on people's lives once they recognize miracles in their own lives? And I, and I was thinking, for example, um, what you wrote about in the book of, about how miracles can shake us up. And, I, and I, you and I had had this conversation before about this Croak app um, <laughs> that you reference in the book. I don't know if everybody read that as well, but 
Uh, if you could just talk about what, you know, the types of things that happen once people realize miracles in their life. Well, I, so it's, it's interesting. To, so this, it's, it's the We Croak app. It's from a couple of guys in Brooklyn. And the object of that app was um, to remind us uh, five times a day that we're going to die. And so, you know, it sounds like a crazy uh, way to approach miracles, but if you've had an extraordinary experience, it is the kind of thing where um, it stops you in your tracks. You know, it, it really forces you to reevaluate, you know, maybe, you know, pretty profound things, the nature of God, you know, what your purpose is, um, you know, here. And uh, for example, there's also a Catholic uh, practice that dates back hundreds of years, um, maybe even more, called memento mori, which is Latin for remember your death. And so um, we start out the book in chapter one, very first sentence is, what would, you, what would you do if you found out that you only had a week to live? You know, so think about that. And the reason we ask the question and the reason that it's connected to miracles, just like you were saying, is that anybody that has experienced, for example, the death of a loved one, you know, you walk outside and you think the buses are still running. You know, the sun is still coming up. And how is that? So it really, really shakes you. And so I think when this contemplation of death, um, which is this Catholic practice and tradition, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's the same thing that happens when we shift our focus where miracles are concerned, because it, it forces you to, to operate in the present. You know, if you have a week to live, all of a sudden, a lot of things, the detritus of your life sort of falls away. And you're just focusing on what's most important, living in the present moment. And, you know, so I think that's how they're related. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, Faith Feed friends, I'd like to open up the floor. I have plenty more questions, but I would love to open up and, and let you all talk to Katie and Joan and ask questions. Jane, go ahead. Hi, I came on a wee bit late, so this might already have been said, but from, uh, from what uh, Joan and Katie are saying, it seems like they would agree with the, the quote that's attributed to Einstein, but nobody knows for sure if he said it or not, but it's, uh, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. And I know in, in my life, I've had lots of things that I could consider miracles, uh, even, uh, even a spider web. <laughs> <laughs> oh, spider web. <laughs> well, I, I would um, thank you for that question. Um, that quote is, is actually in the prologue of the book uh, because we think it's a wonderful quote as well. I, I think it is, in fact, Einstein, even though he did not believe in a traditional uh, the traditional Christian notion of God. Um, I, he believed in mystery, and uh, he certainly believed in the importance of uh, the depth and mystery of the natural world and the beauty of the natural world. But to his actual quote, I think it's be I think it's a wonderful way to. Uh, to look at miracles, and if you think about the Ignatian or Jesuit tradition of God in all things, um, and that, of course, you know, I think Joan and I fall on um, the side of the equation with Einstein uh, that says that, you know, everything is a miracle. But again, back to this, you know, Ignatian philosophy of God in all things, it's kind of the same thing. I think um, if you, behind me, there's a, a collage of several pictures, there's a painting, and in the middle, there's a little thing, and that little thing has um, exactly those words on it. It's one of those tchotchkes you get and has the Einstein quote. My other sort of favorite quote along that, those same lines are, because um, I'm a big Bernadette uh, of Lourdes person, and you know uh, that's a very important um, piece of my own miracle story. But Franz Werfel, who is the person who wrote that book uh, back in 1940, in 1943, um, said something almost the same, which is, you know, for those who believe, no proof is necessary of a miracle. For those who don't believe, no proof is possible. 
So we have this sort of, you know, dichotomy of people. Um, and, you know, I think Katie and I certainly fall into, as Katie says, the, you know, there's no harm in, so, so it goes back to Pascal's wager, you know, there's no, no harm in believing because you, if you win, you win all, Pascal's wager, you know, in, in terms of a belief in God. If you lose, you know, there's no, you know, that didn't matter. But to win and to wage that God is there and God is looking out for us and God does miracles is a joy. It is, you know, everybody's a winner. Wonderful. Um, here's another question from uh, Bob that I, it's related, uh, ladies. It's, it says, um, Katie and Joan, it says, are miracles more prominent in some cultures as opposed to others? My fantasy is that the Irish are more likely to be open to the miraculous. So we have our friend, we have our friend, Catherine with us from Ireland, I see it's on, and I don't know if she would agree, but uh, interesting question about culture and miracles. Well, I think that um, miracles do occur, and you know, no one's got the market cornered, I don't think. I think that perhaps, um, you know, <laughs> my experience, the Irish love a good story <laughs> as much as anyone. And um, part of, which go back to your very first question, it's, it's about sharing stories. And, um, I think that, you know, one of the things that I learned, you know, we learned looking at um, miracles in, in other religions and other cultures, they're all there. You know, um, you've got Muhammad escaping from, you know, uh, Mecca to Medina. You've got the parting of the Red Seas. Uh, you've got, you know, there are some major thunderbolt uh, issues. You've got lots of things in Eastern religions where things are multiplied or, you know, for the good and they're trying to, you know, often miracles are done in many cultures to, to basically um, bring believers into the fold. Um, and, you know, there are parables that are sort of these miracle things, I like, you know, miracle math, like the, the loaves and the, the multiplication of the loaves and fishes on the mount. You know, these, these themes appear in other, in other cultures. But um, I'm good with going with the Irish have more miracles than anyone else. <laughs> I, I would just um, also say that, you know, I, I do think that certain cultures maybe um, are more aware, are, you know, have a cultural belief system that is on the lookout for miracles. And so it's not really about whether they have more, it's really about whether they notice more. And so, um, that's what that's what I would add. Great. So back to this, back to the whole sense of awareness. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Other questions. I, I have a question. Go ahead, Liz. Go ahead, Liz. Um, first of all, thank you for this book. Um, it was it made me think of things that I didn't even realize were so many of these things that happened to me, and I didn't even realize it was a miracle. So I'm glad that that was pointed out to me. Um, and it makes me want to sit down and write them all down just so I have it. But also when you're talking about the quotations in the book, I had heard this before, but I was reminded of it reading the book and it was the, um, uh, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. When I first heard that, that was like, it made me feel great, you know, like it was uplifting and it was powerful. Um, yeah, it's, you know, we're not, we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. And I think that we all um, exercise aspects of, uh, you know, characteristics, whether they're emotional or psychological or social. But day to day, we tend to forget that we have this, um, that we're spiritual beings, not just a spiritual component, but that we are in fact spiritual beings that we're, we're, we're way beyond, you know, our titles or our bank accounts or our, you know, body type, you know, we're, and it's just, it's such an important piece of, um, you know, and it goes to that other question that somebody asked about miracles everywhere. If we're spiritual beings, then, you know, we're living in this, um, and we live in spiritual awareness, then we recognize all around us these, these you know, moments of grace, um, the, the beauty and kindness and love that, that, that surrounds us. Um, so yeah. 
Thanks, Liz. Um, I have to read something that's in the chat that our, another friend from Ireland uh, wrote it here. Uh, it, Rosemary writes, just to entertain you, being from Ireland, my husband and I were stopped today in the park by a man we didn't know who told us of a miracle that had just happened to him, released from ongoing debilitating pain from a prolapse, prolapsed disc after attending a healing service. How about that for synchronicity in light of my intention to attend this talk today? Perfect. And that happens. Like it's, it's remarkable. Katie said she had a miracle face. I mean, people, when, once you start, once you put this like awareness bubble, you know, you kind of open it up, miracles bombard us from various people who just like the man on the street, unknown man on the street, because you know, I, I have a miracle story. This has been following us for 20, 20 years. You know, we laughed that we wrote, our first book was called The Miracle Chasers, but um, The Miracle Chase. And we've often joked that actually miracles are chasing us. You know, we really talk to people, as Katie says, on an airplane, people on the street, people, at the beauty par beauty salon, the nail people, any people come have stories. You tell them what you're doing, or maybe you do, even even if we don't, they'll come up with the story and share it with us. And it's such a gift. And it just really, um, as we you know say all the time, these are gifts that are out there and free and available to all of us. I think you just answered, Brenda asked a question. She said, although you've been collecting stories for many years now, are there times that you still find yourself amazed by the stories of others or even miracles that have happened in your own lives? So I, I guess the answer to that is... Big yes. <laughs> yes, I mean, and one of the things we didn't mention, but that it surprised us. You think, can anything still surprise us? But after the book, right after the book was published, we were on several radio um, shows and radio interviews and the hosts of these radio shows you you could tell they were just kind of on the edge of their seat they had a story that they wanted to share obviously not just with us but with their audience and these were these were just amazing amazing stories um, another question for you guys uh, uh, my friend Linda asked how did you decide which miracles to include in the book and you have this vast collection you know, how did that process work? I think that's a really good question. Um, you know, we had all of these stories and we really tried to, I think, use the bulk of the stories that we had. You know, some stories, we couldn't find the people and we weren't exactly sure we had it exactly right. We tried to write things down as soon as, like if we were at a meeting or a, you know, a presentation and people tell us things, we'll, you know, go back and kind of jot things down right away. Um, but we felt very, we felt that it was very important not to misconstrue these stories because they were important stories to people. Um, and so we wanted to be sure we got it right. But I think that for us, one of the really fun things was trying to put together under these three headings that we've really not talked about yet, about becoming aware, we've talked about that one. Um, the other, one of the other areas was really in deepening connection. You know, these miracle stories that people have once you share these important stories of your life with someone, often they're a defining moment, they, we begin, they, they form a deeper connection. We begin to see the similarities with ourselves instead of how different we all are. You know, I think a lot in the press sort of, you know, focuses on how diff all, everybody's differences when really we have some very core basic beliefs and understandings that are the same. And so, um, that whole second area of deepening connection is really was it really important to us as a as a construct for uh, miracles and so many of the stories and then that then the notion um of the third sort of big area in the book in terms of finding meaning you know we all sort of back in college had these heavy college raps about you know what we, what should we do what's the purpose of life what what's our place in the world and I think that there's ways to sort of help us um, find our best purpose and realize that sometimes we are the right person in the right place at the right time. It's what St. Teresa said, we are where we're supposed to be, you know, and God put us in this place to, to do what we need to do. And all we need to do is sort of accept that and say, and say yes. So 
we once we had these sort of big buckets it was a lot of fun to um kind of decide where the stories would go and obviously many of the stories can go in any bucket um but we really tried to you know hone and pull out certain pieces that would make the stories flow together perfect perfect um our friend val wanted to know how did all of this miracle collecting affect your lives personally wow that's a, that's such an interesting and good question um for me it certainly kept me honest all these things that we talk about in the book awareness connection and meaning uh, we're constantly reminded um, as a result of the gift of these stories and you know we've had i certainly had um just really quickly uh other additional miracles that have happened you know in my life uh that you know, just made it that much more satisfying to understand that these things, these things happen to all of us and, and, and all the time and, and sort of to keep myself honest about that. One of the things that um, I think about these stories and about Katie and I working together, I saw a question about that in the chat, the, this notion of sort of generosity of spirit that is really at the heart of a lot of miracles as well. Um, one of the things and we can get into that in another subsequent question if you want but one of the how did it affect me these miracle stories you know katie there's a story in the book about katie's husband jim um really sharing this generosity of spirit with a cab driver in new york on a rainy night and you know offering to buy him a cup of coffee and just changing the, the stars a little bit for this guy who was just so you know grumpy and it was you know one of the fun things really fun best parts of writing the book in terms of my for me was our Katie and my conversations where we would share these stories or these events in our lives. And it wasn't too, uh, it was a couple of weeks after she had shared the story about her husband, Jim and coffee, that the cab driver who would, was set to pick me up to take me to Logan airport to catch a plane, um, who was 15 minutes late came and I live in an area that has a lot of, uh, coffee shops and espresso shops and in the North end in Boston. And he was like, I, I really, I'm desperate for a coffee. And I'm like, well, I'm desperate to get to the airport because I haven't, you know, less than an hour <laughs> to my plane. And then I remembered the story, the generosity of spirit. I was like, okay, sure, get your coffee. And um, which he did. And we made it to the airport. And once I got there and I was, you know, kind of sweating it the whole way because now I have 45 minutes to get on the plane. There's no line of security. There's no, my gate's the first gate. Everybody else is on the plane. <laughs> I walk onto the plane and I'm like, okay, this is good. So sometimes, you know, writing these stories, hearing these stories of miracles, as Katie said, you know, they kind of made us maybe better people. <laughs> <laughs> and we saw that actually in some of the comments on the Amazon comments that people wrote about the book. They actually said, you know, it sort of changed their perspective and, you know, not to sound corny, but help them be better people. Um, more I remember open, that from the more, book. You know, and I was like, wow, you know, and I, to be honest, that's one of the things that keeps me going on this, you know, miracle journey. I love the concept that you, that this generosity of spirit, doing things for others, thinking of others, and part of the process and deepening connections, and that, that term secret sauce that you came up with. It really is the secret sauce, right? It really is. It allows us to sort of check our egos at the door. It allows us to kind of listen more empathically, you know, instead of just trying to think of the next question. It especially allows us to realize that things are bigger than we are and that we have a job to do, but that, um, you know, we're not the end all and be all. That, you know, there are, things are bigger than, than ourselves. Wonderful. So I think you saw this question, but Bob had a question from a practical standpoint. I think it's very interesting. How do two people write a book together? And Bob, their previous book was three, three, three people that wrote a book together. Um, do you split up the sections? Do you, uh, do you edit each other's sections? Practically, how did that work? <laughs> do we well, edit each other's sections, Katie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To death. <laughs> so, you know, you have to understand, Joan and I have been working together now for 20 years, have written two books together. 
I would say, first of all, it was a joy to write a book with another person. It also taught us that the only way to do that is to employ generosity of spirit. You know, the project itself has to be bigger than any one person's um, opinion or, uh, or agenda. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's this third thing out here and you both need to be um, fully on board with that's what, what it's all about. And, and working with Joan, that was, really, that was really easy for us to do. You know, from a practical standpoint, when Hachette, you know, um, when we signed a contract with Hachette, we were a little bit under the gun because we, we sold the book on what's called on a book proposal. So we had written three of the chapters, but we had another, you know, whatever it is, 14 chapters to write. Um, and we had one paragraph outlines for these chapters. And so Joan and I sort of looked at each other and said, divide and conquer. And so, you know, I wrote half of them. She wrote half of them. Um, amazingly, when we went down the list of what those chapters were, there was literally not a single discussion about which ones we would take. There were certain chapters that really spoke to me and certain chapters that really spoke to her. And then after we each wrote those chapters, we handed them off to the other person. And the other person added research, commentary, edits, you know, ideas for additional stories. And so, you know, it really was a pretty, um, you know, we did it. We wrote those 14 chapters in about, gosh, four months. Um, and so, you know, it, it was, uh, it was, it was good. That's yeah, our first, our first book was written individually, um, in each of our first persons and we would ha do handoffs between the three authors. Um, in the second book, as Katie said, we really decided that it, we didn't want to do that again. We wanted to have one voice. And so, um, the book is written in a, a collective one voice and we'll tell a particular story that Joan had this experience or Katie had this experience, but it is, uh, and we'll never share divulge who wrote which chapters. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was, just thinking, I was just thinking St. Ignatius would be proud for, for the greater good. You seem to conquer it all, you know, it, it worked <laughs> out really well, worked yeah. out really well. Are there other questions that, that um, I think I've covered most of the questions that were in the chat, but anybody want to ask a question? Karen, was there anything that I missed? Um, no, I, I guess um, one question that kind of haunts me about all of this is, um, I know you can't say what's your favorite miracle story, but if you had to pull a story out there that just kind of stays with you, which one was it? Joan, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, you know, there were so many, but I'm going to, I'm going to, tell you one that um, we haven't really talked about at all at this. Um, in the Gospels, miracles are des described as signs. You know, miracle is a sign of whatever. And we talk about in our own definition, miracle is a sign of, div you know, divine intervention. Um, and we, and Kierkegaard talks about, you know, miracles as signs, but they're only signs for people who know what the sign means. Um, so we were, in LA one day, um, and I think this story is in the book, we're in LA one day uh, at a, a presentation, a book signing, and a woman came up to us and said, I have to tell you the story. And she was a, you know, youngish mother of three children. She was very, um, had a very high prominent job in her, in her all male dominated, you know, uh, profession. And um, she said, I, I was going crazy. I had three kids under five. I had a, uh, a husband. I had this job I was supposed to work 80 hours a week at. I needed to work part-time, but nobody ever worked part-time. And I just, I'd worked so hard to get to this job in this position that I just couldn't give it up. And she just, you know, so whatever. So she's, she explained that she was driving down the freeway one day in LA and the kid, three kids are in the back seat, yickety yakking as three kids will do. Um, and she had, you know, too little time, too many errands to do. And she looked up and she said, God, tell me what to do. I just can't keep this up. I, I need a sign. 
tell me what to do. And at that moment, she put her eyes down to the road and she passed a large billboard, very large billboard. And it had Our Lady of Guadalupe on one side of it, uh, you know, who is a big Mexican devotion or devotion to the Blessed Mother in Mexico. It's an advertisement for a Mexican brewery that she was passing. And the sign had two words, just ask. So she's just asked God for a sign. She sees a sign, she drives by a sign that says, just ask. And she says, you know, God, I didn't mean like a sign sign. I meant like, you know, a sign. So needless to say, she went into her office on, on Monday morning, the following Monday, and she said to her boss, you know, I can't do this. It's not sustainable anymore. I really have to work, you know, cut my hours for the next couple of years. He goes, yeah, okay. We were just waiting for you to ask. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's one of those things that the universe, you know, the, the first step in getting the universe, the divine God, we need to put our intention out there. And I think that notion of, of asking, being feeling that we're worthy enough to ask is really, really important. So that's one of my highlight stories. Beautiful, beautiful. Katie, did you want to share one as well? Sure. Um, I would say the story that always has stayed with me is the one that I mentioned earlier um, a woman named Rebecca, she's in chapter two, and we had done a talk at a small bookstore in the Bay Area, in Montclair, uh, California, and we had said at the end of our remarks, does anybody have a story, does anybody have a question, and it was, an, it was one of those things where you asked earlier, like talking about keeping ourselves honest, you know, I have a tendency to feel uncomfortable with the pregnant pause, so I remember just sitting there going, don't say anything, you know, like let it just sit there. And it sat there that sort of in the air for a, an extended period of time. And finally, Rebecca sort of piped in and said, I have a story. Um, it's kind of a long story. So um, I'm not going to go into the whole thing other than to say that the reason that her, she escaped a serial rapist that had been, um, uh, terrorizing the Washington DC, the Georgetown area, um, which is where she lived at the time. She was recently out of college. She was looking for a job. And she ended up in uh, a deserted sort of warehouse office situation with this man, unbeknownst to her who he was at the time, but he was terrorizing her verbally as he showed her around the office space. And there was nobody there to help her and nobody knew where she was. They go back to his office and his phone rings and and an escape had not yet sort of shown itself and um i know i'm kind of editing this story and he doesn't answer the phone obviously the phone rings a, another time he doesn't answer the phone and then the phone rings a third time and he finally picks it up and it was the woman that she was having an interview with the next day and she knew that because, because he said, you know, Yellow Cat Productions, you know, needs to do X, Y, Z. And that was her out. She said, oh my gosh, is that Andrea from Yellow Cat Productions? She yelled it really loud. Um, or she said, this is Rebecca, Andrea. I have, you know, I'm meeting you tomorrow. And so it was her way of letting somebody else know not only where she was, but who she was with. And he hung up the phone. Um, he grabbed her by her arm very roughly, literally shoves her out the door. She loses her shoes. I mean, it's a terrible story. But the coincidence of that phone call and her ability to sort of get out of it, but cut to the end of the day, I had a very long conversation with Rebecca about that story. And she said to me, you know, everyone will see it and say, well, the obvious miracle is that, um, this woman from Yellow Cat Productions called and that I knew that's who it was and I was able to get out of it. But she said, really the miracle to me is that I was able to keep my wits about me in a terrifying situation and, and knew exactly what I should say and do in order to stall this man. And he had all the power and yet at the end of the day, I stalled him long enough to save myself. And she said, if you, she said, I believe that that grace that came over me, you know, during that period of time was actually the miracle. And I just, I just have always thought that that was 
very powerful. Thank you to everybody at, that you know joined us and, and the, all the wonderful questions. And thank you for having us. We really enjoyed it. It was it's been terrific. As you can tell, we can talk about miracles all day long. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. You've been a great audience. Joan and Katie, thank you so very much for being with us for this conversation. The Miracle Collectors is truly a wonderfully inspirational book, which sparks amazing conversation and reflection. I especially love the tools throughout the book, the take a miracle moment challenge questions, as well as the book hub questions. All are so helpful for us to explore our spirituality and support our faith. Thank you for joining us for another episode of God Pods. For more faith resources, visit us at bc.edu backslash c21 and find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at c21center.